The next generation of PC enthusiasts will call us liars. We'll tell them of the glory days of PC gaming, when new graphics card releases were worth buying, and when you could get a top-of-the-line 4K gaming card with 11GB of VRAM for $700. And they'll look at us the way we look at our parents when they'll tell us how they used to be able to just buy a house. Well, you know what? It was true. All of it. And it's actually still pretty damn good. I don't like gratuitous nostalgia. I talk mostly about old CPUs and graphics cards, not because there's something noble about them, but because these days, it's an economic reality that many of us are going to have to live with our tech for longer. So I'm going to quickly debunk one of the myths about the GTX 1080 Ti. It was still a damned expensive card at the time. I wouldn't have dreamt of spending over £600 on a gaming accessory in 2017. I didn't plan on buying a regular 1080 until I found an open box return for 380 which at the time was the most I'd ever spent on a graphics card. What we should all be misty-eyed for is a time before the scalper pandemic, before GPU manufacturers realised many of us would pay whatever price they wanted to charge us. But anyway, let me hop off my soapbox for a minute and tell you all about the 1080 Ti. At the time of writing, Pascal is the oldest, unproblematic generation of GPU from NVIDIA. Maxwell had a couple of models which don't support DX12. There have been a few instances of the 900 series having driver issues with certain games, and the 980 Ti has pretty high power consumption for its performance. So the 10 series is about as far back as I recommend going in 2023. Thankfully, or perhaps damningly, there's plenty of good performance on display in the Pascal series, and while the 1080 Ti won't win any awards for efficiency these days, it still looks to have quite a lot of performance to offer at about 250 watts. Lately it seems like new game releases are targeting 8GB of VRAM or higher, even at 1920x1080, so 11GB cards like this one are experiencing a resurgence in interest from gamers. My example here is actually an EVGA SC2 model that's had its heatsink replaced with a Ryzen Tech Morpheus 2 and a pair of Arctic 120mm fans. The heatsink's seen better days, but there's enough heft here that I think the inevitable sag might actually straighten it out eventually. The aftermarket cooler works a treat. I replaced the thermal paste and it runs at a stone cold 50 to 60 degrees and can boost to about 1900 MHz all by itself. Granted, I am on an open-air test bench, aka cardboard box, so this isn't a review of the Morpheus itself, but it seems to be an excellent performer, and the Arctic fans are pleasantly quiet too. Of course, just like a current GPU is useless without a decent-sized memory buffer, an older GPU with plenty of VRAM is no good if it can't perform. To find out how the 1080 Ti is coping with the shitstorm that is gaming in 2023, I've slotted it into my moderately priced gaming PC, featuring a Ryzen 5 5600X and 32 gigs of DDR4 3600. Thankfully, the PC port of The Last of Us seems to be past the worst of its teething troubles. Since the 1.04 patch, the game now seems to have its VRAM usage under control, and the medium preset no longer looks practically untextured. However, this is the 1080 Ti, and we have 11 gigs of the stuff to play with, so I skipped 1080 medium and went straight to high. This provided a very acceptable 62 FPS average, dropping to the 40s at minimum. There are just enough instances of long, lingering drops into the 50s that you might want to add some upscaling to smooth things out. 1440 might be possible if you're happy playing well below 60 FPS. I chose the medium preset, then went through and manually turned any setting that claimed to be heavy on VRAM up to high, and this, surprisingly, still managed close to 50 FPS. Now, this is a pleasant surprise. Jedi Survivor has also had some performance-enhancing patches applied since its release in late April, and I have to say, they seem to have done some good. The GTX 1080 Ti is not only capable of 1080 at high settings, it can even stretch a little further. The Epic preset doesn't quite manage 60, but high hits a 70fps average. 
If you own a 1440p display, then the high preset will allow for a little under 50 FPS, so a frame limit of 30 or 45 should be a decent experience while looking a good bit sharper than 1080. If you're still hoping for 60 FPS, FSR balanced would be my choice. Also, while I was here, I thought I'd have a go at enabling RT, a feature which is technically possible for Nvidia non-RT cards like Pascal, but in practice many games don't actually seem to support it. Survivor gives a very good reason for this to be the case. Average FPS at 1080 high is in the 30s, and lows drop to the good old cinematic 24, but there are some glitches. At first I thought these might be related to distance or LODs, but they still occur right up close. Still, at least the improved self-shadowing makes Cal's hair a little more tame. The last of the really troublesome titles in my test suite, RE4 Remake is another game that doesn't like it when you try to exceed the recommended VRAM limits. Nevertheless, while it would have been pretty simple to do so, dropping texture quality to the 4GB setting was enough for a mere amber warning. At 1080 and otherwise max settings, the game could run at about 90fps on average. Pushing resolution to 1440 sees that drop to below 70fps, with 1% lows a little below 60. Sadly, the RT function is greyed out, so we don't get to see how the 1080 Ti handles ray tracing in this one. A quick palette cleanser before we dive back into the unoptimized muck, Forza Horizon 5 can still be pretty demanding on VRAM if you opt for higher settings, but I think I should be safe with 11 gigs. Anyone with a 1080p display can look forward to frame rates in excess of 60fps, even at the extreme preset, with the canned benchmark providing an average of 69. Anyone looking to play at 1440 will have to drop to the ultra preset to see almost the same frame rates. Once more, out of curiosity, I gave the RT function a try, and lo, it did appear to be working. At 1080 high with RT Extreme, I could see reflections of the wing mirrors on the side windows, which means that rays were most definitely being traced. Somewhat shockingly, this was all possible at a very playable frame rate, with averages of 64 and lows of 55. Not bad for a card with no RT cores. Having abandoned my Xbox Game Pass version of Halo Infinite after the buggy launcher deleted it from my drive, I've installed the free-to-play version through Steam. This means I can't do my old campaign test runs anymore, but I can still test out multiplayer. Big team battles are the more intensive variety of match, and the 1080 Ti could manage an average FPS of 75 at 1440 high settings, with lows of about 60. Smaller scale matches like Team Slayer are a little lighter on the GPU, meaning for an extra 10 FPS or so at the same settings. Graphical heavyweight A Plague Tale Requiem recently introduced some optimizations for lower end GPUs, but the 1080 Ti doesn't need anyone's charity. At high settings, the 1920x1080 resolution might not be exactly true 1080, thanks to the non-optional upscaling, but even with resolution optimizer set to ultra quality, the game runs at a pleasant 73 FPS on average. Pushing the output res to 1440 sees averages closer to the 50 mark, but if you have a 1440 display, the drop is worth it. The game looks far sharper this way, though the halo around Amisha is still a little distracting at times. God of War is a smooth experience on the 1080 Ti, even at 1440 max settings. In regular gameplay, averages hang around the 60 mark, with lows closer to 50 FPS. Given how intensive cutscenes can be, you might consider some FSR or a drop to the high preset, and the game looks excellent regardless. It seems I kind of forgot to test at 1080, but as I'm sure you can imagine, you can expect frames in the high 80s and 90s out of the 1080 Ti, even with the quality settings maxed out.
Spider-Man Remastered continues the 1080 Ti's winning streak. If you still daily drive this card in 2023, I'm happy to say you needn't be stuck at 1080p in modern games, as Spidey glides along at over 100 FPS. At 1440p that only drops as far as 85, and I dare say you could probably get a 4K60 experience without too many dropped settings, though I didn't get round to testing it this time. Ray tracing is once more greyed out, so unfortunately we don't get to see how the 1080 Ti handles it, which is a shame, because I reckon we have enough horsepower to drive 50 to 60 FPS, maybe with some upscaling. Uncharted 4 also doesn't require compromising on resolution for a smooth experience. At native 1440 Ultra, the 1080 Ti can manage to hold a 70 FPS average, with lows dipping only slightly below 60. Given the style of game, I don't think 90 plus FPS averages are really necessary, but 1080p owners can certainly get that from the 1080 Ti anyway, with an average of 95. I'd hope to try Cyberpunk 2077 with ray tracing enabled, for the lulls more than anything, as I can't imagine Pascal could drive any more than a handful of FPS without some heavy handed use of upscaling. I believe it's been possible in the past, alas, I don't know if I needed a specific driver set, but the game's menu just didn't allow me to enable it. Anyway, in regular rendering modes, I was able to run Cyberpunk at 1080 high for an over 60 FPS average. Increasing to 1440 at the same settings drops that average to 45, which isn't unplayable, but it will make things a little more sluggish. At least the game has a plethora of upscalers built in to help improve the experience. Witcher 3 was also a pleasant surprise. Even though this is a patched next-gen version of the game, running in DX12, the 1080 Ti can still blitz through it. At 1080 Ultra, the game just grazes beneath 100 FPS, with 1% lows of 72. If you have a 1440 monitor, you don't need to do anything in the settings to maintain a smooth experience. The Ultra preset once more delivers a playable frame rate, though this time only 81 FPS on average, with lows dipping slightly below 60. It is worth bearing in mind, however, that parts of The Witcher 3 are extremely CPU intensive, and if you're still pairing your 1080 Ti with a 2017 era CPU, you'll almost definitely see lower frame rates than this. Out of curiosity, I checked and was surprised to see Witcher 3 is another game which will RT with a Pascal GPU. However, this is worse than Survivor, with raw 1080 only hitting about 11 to 12 FPS. Playing with quality settings makes no difference, only upscaling is really of any use, with balanced FSR achieving a 22 FPS average. Ultra performance looks like it might get close to 30, but Geralt's face looks like someone's art project. I took Fortnite for a spin in my usual three test configs, low with epic view distance and 100% res scaling, medium and 100% res scaling, and epic. The former two options work flawlessly, with the low settings option being hard to justify on frame rate grounds. This mode scores 186 FPS at 1440, whereas medium only sees a slightly lower average of 141. Medium is, however, slightly too pretty for serious competitive gamers. Epic, on the other hand, is obviously pretty to a fault. With software lumen and nanite enabled, frame rates plummet as the visual quality skyrockets. Full 1440 can't deliver a smooth 30 FPS, and even adding TSR quality upscaling doesn't really achieve that either, averaging 40 but with 1% still below 30. Warzone 2 wasn't a great time at 1440 Ultra, I mean, any more than it ever is. It averaged over 60 FPS, but 1% lows were a ridiculously low 34 FPS, and I sincerely recommend dropping settings or adding some res scaling to get a better experience here. I don't often recommend playing this or other more realistic looking shooters at 1080 or below, unless you have no other option. But if you do, you'll have a much better time at Ultra. Averages climb into the 90s, and while lows are still proportionately very low, they're slightly more tolerable.
Okay, show of hands. Who expected that of the 13 games tested, the GTX 1080 Ti would still be able to play 8 of them at 1440 with over 60 FPS? I know I was pretty surprised. Even games like Resident Evil 4 held up pretty well, and having the large 11GB frame buffer to hand was useful for playing some of the new games with higher texture settings than even some similar performing modern cards. Compared to the RX 5700 XT, the two GPUs are generally neck and neck, with the occasional game favouring one card over the other, but having the freedom to increase certain settings on the 1080 Ti makes it very appealing. The extra VRAM seems to be keeping the used costs high, as the average going rate seems to be over £200, whereas the 5700 XT costs way less, and the 6700 costs only slightly more. Pros and cons aside though, it's still impressive that a 6 year old GPU can prove itself this relevant in 2023. Imagine if this wasn't an exception to the norm, as if the 780 Ti had performed this well in 2019, or the 980 Ti in 2021, and that the 1080 Ti wasn't the only fondly remembered high-end GeForce of the last decade and a half. For the time being, one can only imagine how well the 4090 will hold up in 2029. Thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.